Hello, gentlemen. All right, thank you so much. Okay. All right, the one on the on your right is Pastor Andrew Schluter. Woo! All right. Yeah. The one on his left is his sidekick, Robin. No, no, no. It's Evangelist <laughs> Randy Keener. Okay, he doesn't like that already. Right. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, gentlemen, for doing this for us. We sure appreciate that. What's going to happen is uh, I'm going to talk to you both, actually, and then, you know, just talk about random topics, you know, doctrine. You both just be yourselves. You, you don't have to talk to me. Most of the time, I like to see you both talk to each other, to be honest. <laughs> I'll, I'll interrupt every time. Since I'm the host, I'll interrupt every time and then lead us uh, back to continue the structure again, okay? So we'll do it that way at the beginning. Then we'll get to questions. So the people will bring me the question. I'll read it off to you. All right. So, uh, hey. All right, then. So it looks like there's a little bit of a lag, maybe, huh? I guess. So we'll see what happens. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, first things first. Okay, then. So I have a doctrinal question. Okay. So uh, my question uh, for you gentlemen is concerning about where demons come from. So I hear different Bible believers talking about that uh, devils, if we don't want to call them demons, they come from spirits of Genesis 6, after they died out in the flood. Other people, uh, they believe that they are fallen angels who transformed into devils. Me, I don't believe in that one. Um, there's a new thing coming out. I don't know if you both heard of this, but I've started to teach it myself where because it connects with unclean spirit, kind of like Holy Spirit, it kind of comes from breath. So I'm wondering if the devil breathed out devils himself because Revelation 16, we see that he breathed out uh, three unclean spirits like frogs. So I'm wondering if you both have your own opinions on where devils come from. And you both just discuss with yourselves. If you both have a disagreement, argue with each other too. Just be with your, be yourselves. I mean, I smell some people's breath smell like devils, so I can see that theory maybe is true. <laughs> that seems like the most reliable theory, huh? What about you, Brother Keen? Oh, uh, I mean, I, I don't feel like the Bible is super clear on it. You know, the kind of the thing that most people use for it is uh, that a third fell, which, yeah. you know, technically I don't believe we should put till the end, till mm -hmm. Revelation. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure how explicit it is. Um, my general meaning is that it's to do with the souls that are the, uh, the, the fallen uh -huh. ones who died in the flood. Yeah. Okay, then. I see. So it seems like, uh, Brother Sluter, you agree with the one where it comes out of breath? That's what you think? Makes no, the most sense? No, I was expecting a joke. Oh, bummer. Um, okay, then. <laughs> bummer. All right, then. What do you think? Um, I, was, uh, I, I agree with Brother Randy. I think it's probably from like when the uh, Let me increase the volume. Devils, uh, or when the, before Genesis 6, and possibly even from like where they were messing around with animals. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you look at it, unclean spirits oftentimes are associated with animals. So in Genesis six, they were messing around with, with animals um, as they mm -hmm. like to do. So mm -hmm. possibly the offspring of those devils and those animals also produce these unclean spirits. Yeah. But I, I and that tends to be more a traditional view. Uh, Pember taught it in his book Earth Early Saints. Uh, Larkin taught it. Yeah. I think maybe Schofield taught it. I'm not uh -huh. positive. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, but yeah, I, I tend to stick with that view that it's this people before the flood. Uh -huh. Do you think, um, am I wrong that Larkin mentioned they're like the spirits of the deceased or the dead of the, of the intermingling of the sons of God at Genesis 6? Am I wrong about that one? That Larkin mentioned that they were. The de uh, basically the ones who drowned out at the flood, the the giants, the offspring of the sons of God, when they drowned out at Noah's flood, or uh, actually what I think Pember and those people taught during the Genesis gap, when they drowned out in that 
uh, universal flood, their spirits became devils. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's what Pember taught. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then Larkin, I think Larkin may have put put mm -hmm. it at the Genesis flood. Okay then. All right. Uh, let's uh, get a little controversial. So. Uh, <laughs> Brother Keener, uh, would you say, because, <laughs> you could probably predict. So, Brother Keener, because of your different viewpoint on Genesis 1, would you honestly say that's the reason why you're holding on to your theory how devils are born? But if you kind of agree what we do on Genesis 1 about mm -hmm. the universal flood, do you think, uh, if you're open to that, what Sluter said would sound more reasonable to you? No, no, no. no. Okay. To me, the the gap. It, it's Stop not, laughing, guys. I <laughs> so I, I don't. I don't necessarily need it, but now I'm going to get blown up. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, King James well, Bible. <laughs> praise the King James Bible. Amen. Uh, my other question is this: is that um. What's the most interesting doctrine that, uh, to you, something you personally discovered yourself or something you studied yourself from other people? Uh, with Brother Keener and also Brother Sluter, what's the most interesting doctrine uh, that fascinated you? you? You go first because I, I know so many. You can kind of filter them out. We've had some bad audio problems, and every time we talk, for whatever reason, the headphone that I'm using feels like, Whoa. and it makes my head feel like it's watery. It, it, oh, hold on. Hold it's on. devils. <laughs> yeah, I think I know. Okay. Please. There. There it is. Is it fixed? Maybe. We need transparency. Can y'all hear us? Yeah. Transparency for us to hear people in the room. Now, here's what we need. <laughs> I can hear you both. Off. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> off. Off. Now you're kind of messing up. Can you hear us now? It's the same to me. It's the same to me. I hear you both very clearly. Okay. okay. Well, just tell me what your favorite doctor is. Alright, my favorite doctor is, uh, Lord, I don't know. Um, oh, you got a lot, Brother Sluter, you know? You got a lot. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I like the controversial ones sometimes. Oh, that's that's pretty obvious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably one that I came to a realization of in, well, I will say is I don't, know, I don't know what you teach about us, so I don't know what you just saying. Uh, call it out, preacher, call it out. <laughs> he, he, okay, he's the one who put us on here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Pretty much dogmatic about it is the three hours of darkness while Jesus saw the cross. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought so too. Yeah. And, and him suffering in hell for three hours while he's on the cross. Can you uh, expound? Uh, it's controversial already anyway, but could you expound the. Uh, you don't have to talk too much about it as best as you can, but the three hours of darkness, that's uh, when the Bible talks about that. You think that connects to the darkness in hell where Jesus went down into? Do you think there's a connection to those two? Yeah, I mean, because what's interesting about it is, is like, so B. H. Carroll, yes, who was who was J. M. Carroll's brother. J. M. Carroll's the guy that wrote the Trail of Blood. So yeah. I have all of his commentaries. Uh, B. H. Carroll, yeah, and he taught that the three hours of darkness is uh -huh. when Jesus' soul literally went into hell and he suffered. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Charles Spurgeon taught the exact same thing in his right. commentary uh -huh. on Psalms and the commentary of David. Uh -huh. um, so, what they taught and what I teach, mm -hmm. and by the way, I didn't get it from them, interestingly enough. Uh -huh. I, um, mm -hmm. They just kind of confirmed what I was already studying. Mm -hmm. But while Jesus is on the cross, he mm -hmm. cries in those three hours of darkness. He mm -hmm. cries, My God, my God, why stop forsaking me? Mm -hmm. He also cries out, I thirst. Mm -hmm. So, that would be while his while his soul is in hell, uh -huh. those three hours of darkness. Um, what's happening to him physically also seems to be happening to him spiritually in hell. Mm -hmm. And so you would have. Uh, what's interesting about it is when the high priest would go in every year to the holiest of all within uh -huh. the second veil, 
there was no light allowed in there. Now, I know mm -hmm. some people try to talk about the Shekinah glory or the Shekinah yeah. glory, whatever, but the Bible never mentions there being a light or mm -hmm. the Shekinah or the Shekinah glory. Mm -hmm. That comes from the Kabbalah, Jewish yeah. mysticism. Uh -huh. Okay? So, there was, as far as we know, there was no light uh -huh. allowed in the holiest of all. Mm -hmm. Therefore, every transaction of blood that took place mm -hmm. took place in total darkness. So it makes sense that while Jesus is hanging on the cross, when he uh -huh. literally becomes sin, yeah. that there's total darkness. You know, it just, uh, do you think it's far-fetched to say, I don't know if you found something, but remember when Abraham, when uh, he had, uh, I guess, uh, the, anim uh, the sacrifices or animals laid out, there was a moment of darkness. Do you think that might have any connection to that, that the Lord's, trying to do with Abraham concerning Jesus Christ or with the Holy of Holies, you think? You think it's I've never thought of that, but yeah, I'd probably say that now. <laughs> you know what you said. All right, all right. Uh, if people blame me, I'm going to put on you. No, Sluger taught that, you know. I heard it from him. <laughs> Y'all heard that, right? Y'all heard that, right? What? 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 From him. All right, Brother Keener, what's the most interesting doctrine to you that you discovered? All right, well, I, I don't know what the most interesting one is mm -hmm. because, I, I mean, just like Andrew, I've been doing this for a while too. Yeah. But one of the first ones that actually didn't seem like a big deal to me but did put me on the ropes with some of the fundamentalists. I have a fundamentalist background. Yeah. Um, Love Dr. Ruffman, but before I even knew who he was, I was a Bible believer mm -hmm. and uh, loved the Word of God and mm -hmm. studied it. And so, you know, if you're a student of the Bible, it, it's going to lead you into something. Some strange places to people. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, one of the first ones that kind of put me on the ropes mm -hmm. was about what happened to Elijah mm -hmm. uh, when he was taken up. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially that he was just transported elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't taken up in the third of heaven. John chapter 3 makes it clear that yeah. no man has descended up. Correct. And heaven will come down from heaven except the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Uh -huh. So that was that was one of the first ones that started to put me on the ropes with <laughs> some people because, as you know, you can't go against anything that's traditionally taught. Yes, <laughs> correct. <Yeah. laughs> amen, amen. I have a, an interesting question for you both. Was there a doctrine, uh, Brother Sluter, that, or an opinion that you disagree with your friend Randy Keener, but it turned out that he was right and you were wrong. And Brother Keener, was there a doctrine that Brother Sluger taught that you disagree with, but then it turned out he was right and you are wrong? This is proof that you both can prove to all the world that you're both humble people and you receive correction. And that you're not arrogant, know it all, so you teach controversial doctrine. Prove it right here! But I'm also a truth. <laughs> but you know, for, for me to agree with Randy about everything would mean that we'd both be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that was very fast. All right. Hey, no, I, I've actually got one. I've got oh, one. you got one? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, but it was him that was wrong. No, but it was <laughs> some of a, a point of contention for, for a little while. Not contention, that's the wrong word. But uh, disagreement. disagreement for a while. And that's the day of Christ. Ah, interesting. Um, yeah, but you didn't explain it the way that I came about. Okay, right. What about you, Brother Keener? Was there something that you were able to prove him wrong? That Brother Sluter agreed with you? There's got to be something, right? That... That he proved me wrong on? Uh, no, that you proved him wrong on. So I switched the yeah, question. The, the, for sure, it was the day of Christ. The day of Christ, that one? <laughs> that. Well, oh, this Luther I agree? I, I, I'm going to throw him under the bus because he didn't just take his medicine. <laughs> we were on the broadcast, <laughs> and the way it got straightened out was uh. with Douglas Stalker. Ah, uh, uh, I'm going to get a call. Now I'm going to get a call. Randy? <laughs> I get a call every time we mention him, but he was on the broadcast, he didn't believe it, and uh, I, I, in a spirit of respect, I felt like I just need to pull back <laughs> and not talk about it, but yes, you didn't agree with that, and now you did. Yeah. Okay, then, okay. I thought, I, I, 
I didn't really hear it clearly from Brother Sluter, but now he humbly said, yeah, like that. So <laughs> that, that's evidence. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, along. <laughs> okay, then. So good news. We got a whole bunch of questions now. All right. So, oh, man. All right, then. All right. Um, uh, Ephesians 1 7, redemption equals buyback. What can that entail? We were saved, uh, for example, Romans 7, maybe Adam's perfect state, just purchased us out of bondage. Your thoughts? Well, I agree with all that. I think so too, right? <laughs> Brother Keener, you, you're deep in thought. It looked like you had an answer yeah. or nothing. Oh, uh, well, my wife was setting up um, the service over here so we can actually see what's happening. Like from the people on the internet. Oh, okay. So we, we were watching. <laughs> There's a lag. <laughs> I agree with that, but I'll make a comment on it as well. You uh -huh. actually heard me say this when we preached together a few weeks ago in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, words like redemption, justification, sanctification, you know, all those good words that end in ION in the book of Romans. Uh -huh. um, I, I feel like a lot of Bible believers would be very well served if they spent less time with black is beautiful yes, amen. and more time with theological studies. Amen. 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 The shuns, right? The shuns. So, uh, right. The meat, meat and potatoes of, of the Bible is those good doctrines. That's really so good. A lot of the deep doctrines, too, where we get from, we wouldn't have gotten it if it weren't for those, like you said, the meat and potatoes parts, right? Those are so important. Right. So I think what we're all guilty of is that at times, because we feel like it's so basic, it's something we already know, we don't want to, we don't spend time majoring on those foundational parts more where we could have gleaned a lot more good stuff, you know? So, Absolutely. Yeah, amen. Yeah. All right. Um, in Leviticus 27 29, it looks like God is asking for human sacrifice. Uh, how can I tell an unbeliever this isn't the case? So Leviticus 27, 29. Well, Leviticus what now? 27, 27 29. 27, 29. Mm -hmm. If you have a King James Bible. <laughs> oh, apparently in the wrong place. Where? 27, 29. Oh, I'm going to do the wrong one. So it's, uh, the confusion, it looks like, is uh, it sounds like human sacrifice to the person. Right. Sounds like that to me, too. All right, amen. Next question. So, uh, no, I need an answer. I have a different opinion. I don't know. <laughs> oh, he's studying. Feel free, you both can discuss with each other, too. You don't have to look at me and answer. Feel free to discuss on this passage more. Okay, so maybe, okay, so hold on. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking at it. Okay. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Mm -hmm. Every devoted thing in the soul of the Lord. None devoted, which shall be devoted of men, shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Mm -hmm. Because oh wait, mm -hmm. it's 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 the it's the thing that's devoted of man. Yeah, but it can be both of man, of man and beast in verse twenty-eight. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that this is talking about human sacrifice. No. Now, maybe somebody's dying, but I don't think it's human sacrifice. Okay, then. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Okay, then. Yeah, because uh, it doesn't make sense where Leviticus, you know, condemns it, actually, about humans being sacrificed. So, scriptures obviously don't contradict themselves, so I'm in full agreement with that one. But, but outside uh, of, of obviously mm -hmm. Christ's sacrifice, I, I think really the closest that we can get. Yes. Um, I thought that this is where you're going was Jephthah. 
But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I wouldn't see that there. Okay, then. Then we'll move on to the next question right there. Uh, what, in the Millennial Kingdom, what happens to the people who dies being unsaved if there can be possible to live without salvation? Okay, can you say that again? Yeah. So I think the question is basically asking that during the Millennial Kingdom, if there's an unsaved person that just happens to die, what happens to that person? Because it sounds like that a person... He can continue. Uh, he can continually live in the millennial kingdom, you know, without getting saved, you know, without just instantly dying, because the verse mentioned about a sinner would die at the age of a hundred. So I think that's a confusion there. Yeah. I mean, that thing is good to hell. Uh, yeah, and, and I mean, there's going to be plenty of, of people who do die during the millennial kingdom. Um, you know, that rock iron that the Lord's carrying around. He's using that to, to hit people with and break them into splinters. So. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. They all get afraid of the Lord. It makes me yeah. wonder. It makes me wonder if he keeps track because I think Tim LaHaye, in his books, he mentioned like during the Millennial Kingdom, there are these underground unbelievers. So they kind of hide out from the Lord and then they plot something, which could make sense because in Revelation twenty. You know, how does Satan get all those many people? You know, he had to do it underground. So, it makes you wonder, during the Millennial well, Kingdom... Yeah, go ahead, brother. Well, yeah, so let me... I didn't even interrupt your picture. No, no, go there. <laughs> but, uh, basically, Darren Penland, who teaches in our institute, yeah. his theory is that, mm -hmm. because of the destruction of Gog and Magog mm -hmm. in Ezekiel 38, mm -hmm. that those, the ancestors or excuse me, the, um, the, the offspring, yeah, offspring. Of, of Gog and Magog, of those nations, mm -hmm. hold some type of vendetta or grudge against the Lord for destroying them. Mm -hmm. And so when you see Genesis 20, or excuse me, Revelation 20, as they reemerge, mm -hmm. it's Gog and Magog that come up against them. Mm -hmm. And so there's some kind of, quote-unquote, you know, underground... Uh, group yeah. of people that are plotting, and yeah. then Satan's finding they're waiting for Satan to be released. And once he's released, they go and try to get their revenge for what happened a thousand years prior. Mm. So it sounds like then the answer to the question would be: Let's say if one of those underground people just happened to die during the millennium, he just goes straight to hell. And then if he didn't die during the millennium, he just continues doing his thing. I guess that's logical to say, right? Yeah, but I, I think it's also important to note that mm -hmm. that there will still be like natural death during the Millennial Kingdom. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There will still be natural death. It's just mm -hmm. the curse will be lifted. Yeah. So there will be length of days, but there still won't be anybody that'll just like infinitely live or whatever. That's true. They'll age. True. They'll age mm -hmm. very similar to how they aged before the flood. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. First Corinthians fifteen: the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Yeah. And I think also that the Bible mentioned the wicked sinner just lives up to 100. So I think the Lord puts a cap on it. You know, that's also possible, maybe. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. All right, here's an easy question. All right. Do aliens exist? And if they do, are they demons? That's simple, right? <laughs> well. <laughs> Black is beautiful, Brother Keith. Black is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, do... do Aliens exist? No. Mm -hmm. uh, are they demons? Yes. <laughs> See, he told you. Easy. What's your answer, Brother Slew? I don't know what the demons are, but my Bible tells me yeah. the devil. Devil, oh, you can't even believe it. All right, that sounds good. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, I'm not sure if this is really true or not, but it seems like there are stuff going around where people talk, talk about they might, there might be a temple of Melchizedek uh, that Jews claim to have found. Uh, do you know if that has anything to do with end times? I haven't heard that either. Yeah, I know. I haven't heard of that either. Yeah. Yeah. If that's going around, it's not going around. It's not going around my you sure? You sure? It's not, we didn't get it from you guys? <laughs> okay. Oh, no. All right, then. All right. Let's see. Mm. 
we can't lose salvation, but what if you pray for your salvation, gain it, and feel like you and feel like you lost it the very next day and repeat? So perhaps the person is, uh, you know, this is it's more like if a person, uh, it is common, I do know, where people kind of doubt their salvation, where they're not in a sense really denying eternal security, but they just want to make sure, right? Because they probably do you recall everything in the gospel? So, what's the fine balance in handling this, gentleman? Well, I mean, Martin Luther, who I don't think was a saved man, but mm -hmm. that's a different subject for a different time. He did say, <laughs> um, Martin Luther did say that feelings come and feelings go. Uh -huh. And feelings are deceiving. Yes. My word is the word of God, and us is worth believing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I do think that sometimes you just don't feel safe, and that's just simply what it is. You just have a feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that's oversimplifying it, but that's just mm -hmm. kind of really what it is. Okay. Well, it, it, as brass tech simple as I can make it, ultimately, someone who doubts their salvation, and, and I did as a, a younger person for several years. Mm -hmm. um, Ultimately, what that is, is just not really trusting God to do what he said, mm -hmm. uh, as, as simplistic as that is, yeah. or um, somehow being deceived into thinking that you did have something to do with it, that the prayer that you prayed wasn't right, or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, people get things in their head. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the issue, that uh, it's the word of God. We're trusting God to do what he said he would do. And yeah. we're having the faith to believe that. Yeah. Makes I'll sense. say this out of the like hundreds of people that I've dealt with yeah. that, that have doubted their salvation, uh -huh. there's probably only been maybe mm -hmm. one or two, mm -hmm. maybe three, mm -hmm. that I would look back and say, I don't think they were really saved. Mm -hmm. Most yeah. people that doubt their salvation are not doubting it because they're not actually saved. Mm -hmm. They're doubting it because they are saved mm -hmm. and the devil is messing with them. Yeah. Well, 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 or a preacher that can't be. Or, yeah, or a preacher is preaching bad doctrine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, that was very needful. Thank you so much for answering yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Do you think cherub faces come before the animals they depict? Probably not because man's face, right? But angels have uh, the face of man. If so, do you think animal existed before man? Or simply the face was on cherub but not its own creature. I think what the question is basically asking is that what came first? Was it the cherub or the animal? The reason why they're asking that is because the cherub is representing perhaps an animal kingdom. So maybe they were in charge of a group of animals. If uh, there were some kind of animal creatures before uh, the six days of creation, that could make a lot of sense that's what Dr. Rutman believed where dinosaurs came from. So maybe that's what's confusing the person. So they're wondering if the cherub came first or was the animal first. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I think the egg came first. The, the, the egg came first. <laughs> um, Not sure? I mean, I would say that the chair, well, so, hang on, hang on two seconds, I need, to, I need to take care of some administrative stuff. Okay. Like, you know, one of those soda waters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to go All right, sorry, we, we had to get something to let our whistle here. All these bottles are watching the famous Thursday. Um, so, I would say that probably the cherubs came first because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as the Lord is creating, you know, so I, I don't know, of course, I'm a gapper. Because mm -hmm. uh, I love Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah! Glory to God, brother! <laughs> no, I, I am a gaffer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I put mm -hmm. before that gap. Mm -hmm. Of course, I definitely believe that the mm -hmm. angels were roaming around and things like that. Yeah. But I'm not going to say that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't say that dinosaurs were before. You know, that's where dinosaurs came from before the gap. Yeah. I'm not. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really. I don't think there's a way to super pinpoint. Yeah. Some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to say animals, God created the animals that we have on day six, which He did. Yeah. 
even if you're a gapper, or a non-gapper at that, mm-hmm. that the angelic beings were created before that, yeah. before yeah. Job 38. Yeah. Right. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, as, as the Lord is creating both earth and all that kind of stuff, the, mm-hmm. the sons of God and the morning stars are shouting to him. Now, if you wanted to split hairs, yeah. which, you know, I mean, somebody, I guess, could, mm-hmm. and say, well, the cherubim are, are not the sons of God and the morning stars. Mm-hmm. Well, then, okay, you can maybe split hairs with that. Mm-hmm. But if, if, if Lucifer was a cherub, yeah, and he was, mm-hmm. obviously mm-hmm. we would put him being created. He, he presented himself with the sons of God in Job yeah. 1 and 2. So I would put all the angelic beings <clears throat> being created prior to day 6 of creation. Got it. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that the cherubs came first. All right, then. I, it sounds like, Brother Keener, you agree with that, too, it sounds like, correct? Yeah, yeah. I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> an agreement! That's wonderful. You want to have an agreement. This is boring. I want to hear some disagreements. I want to hear some fights, you know. <laughs> but usually it'll be happening at restaurants. Actually. Yeah, I know. Well, we should have given, you should have had food in front of you at doing this, yeah. you know. That would have been different. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Jesus is set down on the Father's right side. Where is the Father if there's only one throne? Uh, oneness guys try to say there's no Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you say about this answer? Hey, let me crack up to this uh, strawberry sparkling water, and I'll uh, I'll let Randy answer this. <laughs> I think uh, Andrew needs to, uh, to lead the way on this. Where are all these questions coming from, guys? Wow, you guys know how to ask them, you know? Or it's just probably been too long for you guys. guys that knew about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pro- probably, probably all the infiltrators. <laughs> we got them all here, brother. We got them all here. I mean, this, this has already covered our two biggest battles. <laughs> since we started. Um, are you getting Revelation 2? Okay, so then... Uh, you, you, literally, you, you literally cannot get me in any more trouble than I <laughs> Well, I, I'll say it like this. Yeah. I'll say this. When, when we first got it, the, the first big fight we had was no. over the Trinity, which yeah. probably should have been because you're trying to explain the unexplainable. Right? Yes, correct. Yes. And uh, so anyway, that was the first big battle we had because mm-hmm. uh, essentially the guys on the other side were trying to uh, more so line up with... with I feel like what's presented in the Athanasian Creed than what's presented in Scripture. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, exactly. the whole the whole fiasco started not with the Bible verse, but with the Eruptman quote, and they said, <laughs> "Do you agree with this?" I happen to agree with whatever it was, and, and mm-hmm. Andrew didn't. But mm-hmm. basically, where we got to in the end was I just sent a bunch of Dr. Ruttman's quotes from his commentaries and theological studies. Mm-hmm. And uh, he made this statement. I'm not claiming it. I'm just quoting it. Yeah. <laughs> he said, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Father manifest in the flesh, you're lost as a ball in high weeds. Mm-hmm. And he said that in his John commentary. Yeah. That's not in the culture. So he says John. And so and then seven times that I count. Yeah. There's probably some numerology there. Well, <laughs> well, I'm going to say this, uh, you know, whether people see me as, uh, whether people get mad at me or not, but if I'm going to be totally honest, if we were all, and people who've been up for years, you've heard Bible-believing pastors saying the same thing, you know, like tongue-in-cheek, you know, we weren't getting into the nitpicky parts of every detail on the Trinity and all that. I know that a lot of people ever since that bandwagon happened, you know, that ruckus was going on online. I had so many people trying to contact me, getting my viewpoint on it. But me, I didn't want to because I saw it as something so nitpicky because from all the way back then, I've heard people, you know, saying Jesus, you know, is 
uh, God the Father, you know, uh, and they just meant that tongue in cheek, you know, or some old sermons, you know. They weren't like thinking every right. single nitpicky part about, you know, the three different persons of oneness. That wasn't an issue that time. Because oneness, it wasn't a big deal even that time, so. Right, and, and what, and, and here's the thing, so like, um, when, when we're talking about, like, so like Dr. Rutman said seven different times in his theological studies that Jesus Christ is God the Father manifested in the flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if I would even say it like that. Yeah, sure. He did. And, mm -hmm. But I understand what he means when he says yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and interestingly enough, what got Servetus killed by the murderer John Calvin no. was John Calvin mm. didn't like how Servetus explained the Trinity. Ah, interesting. It was literally over wording. It wasn't uh, even over necessarily the theological doctrine. It was over the wording. Uh, and I think what's interesting is, is when we talk about oneness, yeah. oneness traditionally has been the belief that God can only manifest as one person at one time. Yeah, uh, yeah, correct, correct. That, that's correct. That's, correct, that's, correct, correct. that's true blue modalism. <laughs> okay? That was what was taught by like yeah. T.D. Jakes and stuff. Yes, like correct, that. correct. Back yes. when T.D. Jakes actually talked, it's a little bit of doctrine. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, that's true oneness, that's true modalism. Something that we've never taught. We believe that yes. God can manifest himself and it's all three. Uh, at every, you know, in all three kinds, he does it. He does it co-equally, co-existently. They're all three persons in all one, yes. eternally. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. like to 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 have accused us of the oneness thing was yeah. just uh, it was wild. Well, yeah. it, before we move on from that, you yeah. know, the old uh, analogy, and there's multiple of these, but uh, one that a lot of guys would go to is is the water thing, ice liquid and vapor. Uh -huh. When you're discussing that, you are actually describing mobilism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. What you have to yeah. understand if you're presenting a true picture of this is that the water would have to be ice, vapor, and liquid at the exact same moment. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's a lot of depth to there. So yeah. There's a, a lot of bad analogies that have been used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that uh, there's a recently, ever since three years ago, uh, people have been claimed because they've been nitpicky on this issue. They've now been uh, claiming that it's a bad analogy. You know, they've been saying that with the water, with um, body, soul, spirit, and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's what happens when people start getting more and more into it. You know, more nitpicky. So uh, then let's f finally get off that question and <laughs> get into this one. All right, what does Proverbs twenty-seven fourteen mean? Why is it a curse to bless your friend in the morning with a loud voice? <laughs> okay. You both never did that to each other? <laughs> yeah. Okay, have you ever been sleeping and someone yelled in your ear? Yes. <laughs> That's why. <I'm> <laughs> yeah, especially if it's like five in the morning. Five in the morning. <laughs> you both two things I hate. I hate, I hate being cold and I hate getting up early. Oh, I hate being cold. <laughs> You both never did something that mean to each other before? Never happened? We've never been awake to this. I didn't even know 5 o'clock came twice in a day. Yeah. <laughs> I, if, if I ever call you at 5 in the morning, just know that I've been up since then. Not that I've been up. <laughs> I think majority can agree with that one. All right, next one. Does the vine of the earth in Revelation 14, 19 have any sort of relationship with or to the tree of life? Revelation 14, 19 mentions the great wine press. Do you think there could be multiple wine presses? I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to shoot your hand on this first? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say I don't think there's multiple wine presses. Mm -hmm. I think that this is part of um, going through the book of Revelation that you're dealing with uh, essentially four times. Um, and depending on how you look at outside of that, up to seven times mm -hmm. going through the tribulation, four times definitely on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that is the end cap. On one of those times through the wine press of God's wrath. Mm -hmm. So I do not think there, there are multiple. 
but that is the danger that a lot of guys who are like mid-trip or, or yeah. um, pre-wrath, mm -hmm. you know, essentially post-trip, get into when they just try to take it all chronologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because even if you divide it up, so, uh, you know, our, our friend in, in, in Phoenix, uh -huh. um, the, the way that even he divides it up uh -huh. is you have it split in two with Revelation 11 being the middle part. Yeah, correct. Well, then you have a problem with Revelation 14. You have two white presses, and there was even yeah. some times where some of those guys started defecting away from the pre-trib, or forgive me, from the pre-rap, yeah. uh, post-trib, whatever, mm. because they were seen like Revelation 14. Because yeah. if, if this is chronological, even from the viewpoint of the pre-rap or post-trib pre-rap, yes, you now have Babylon falling twice. Correct. You yeah. have wine, the wine press twice. Correct. And guys just started to see that inconsistency. Yeah. Unfortunately for a lot of them, their pride wouldn't ever allow them to be pre-trib. Yes. Um, so they went to a true post-trib position. Mm -hmm. All righty then. This is one question. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, which talks about the rewards uh, being taken. Is it possible that our judgment seat of Christ's rewards is taken from Lucifer? Is that a possibility by chance or no? I think they're stretching it. What verse is that? Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. I think that's simply about the part about the works turning to gold, silver, precious stones. I'm right there. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, with a stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for they shall declare it, because it shall be built by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, of what sort it is, if any man's work, by the chief. I built thereupon, he shall receive the work of any man's work. Shall be burned, he himself shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Um, no, to the point of this being anything to do with Lucifer, because this is uh, the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne. Yeah, so just us, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I will tell you something good, though. Yeah. Uh, I, think this, I think this came from a John Phillips commentary. Mm. Um, he was talking about the wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. He said that all of the things that you can see above ground, so all the things that can be seen with the naked eye, the gold, silver, precious, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, the wood, hay, and stubble, mm -hmm. that's all the stuff that's going to burn up, yeah. but it's all the stuff that's hidden yeah. beneath the earth that you can't see with the naked eye. Oh, that's going to be reported. Oh, wow. That's really yeah, good. That, that's some good stuff for Phillips. Yeah. You got to read a lot of time those good things and build the books. Yeah, amen. Glory to God. What do you think, Brother Sluder? Amen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How close to the rapture do you think we are? And I also want to add, do you have your own theory on a date or an approximate time or an event? I'd like to hear what you both say. Or do you think it's imminent? It's just imminent. You know, it's, well, it's heresy. You we're know. we're getting closer today than we were yesterday. No, don't give me that. No, no, don't give me that. Don't give me Sammy Allen right. stuff. We're yeah. closer now. I don't care what <laughs> oh, don't give me Sammy Allen quotes, man. I want to hear from you both. You both. Do you have something I mean, more? I, I definitely believe in imminency. There was a while there yeah. because uh, I didn't have uh, Randy Keener. Well, it was well, no, <laughs> those are the dates, actually. Um, <laughs> um, but there was a time when I had Second Thessalonians gone up, couldn't figure out what, but they didn't believe in that for a while, didn't they? Yeah, but when I got straightened out, I pulled you out of it. Yeah, well, I, maybe. And so, uh, I had this Second Thessalonians 2 gone up, so I thought we were going to see mm, the Antichrist, yeah, uh, and I thought yeah, we were going to uh, see a falling away. Yeah. Um, we, which, you know, that can be, that can be loosely defined, you know, according mm -hmm. to what, who you talk to. So I actually didn't believe in intimacy for a while. Um, but I do think that that it's, it's imminent. I think it can happen at any moment. Yes, um, definitely. Of course, Chad Reese has an interesting theory about 2033. That's probably yes. one of the best I've ever heard. Yeah, I have um, if, if I had to slap a date on it, maybe yeah. 2033. Yeah. But, you know, that's speculation at best. Well, sure. Back to my friend, Brother Allen, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yes. He used to say this when he was preaching, mm -hmm. that there's not one thing left to be fulfilled before the, the rapture of the church. Right. And I really started thinking about that, and that's when it hit me. There's never been one thing that needed to be fulfilled. It's always been imminent. The rapture. That's, that's really good. Not, not the second advent. 
But the rapture ha has been imminent from the time that Christ went away. Yeah, that, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very um, interesting. Mm. Yeah, C.S. Lewis said um, that one of the greatest embarrassments to Christianity mm -hmm. was that the disciples believed that Christ was coming in their lifetime. Mm. One of the greatest <laughs> embarrassments to Christianity yeah. to C.S. Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Narnia. He was on Narnia yeah. that night. Yeah. Uh, he was into children's books, so... He was living in La La Land. Yeah, he was in living in La La Land. <laughs> so, even though I don't completely agree with that statement, that changed my entire perspective now on a preacher point of view, and even dispensationalism explains a lot on transitions, too. That's, that's very eye-opening, actually. So, I appreciate that statement. Man, those old-time preachers had it, man. Those old-time preachers had it, man. All right, then. Okay, who do you think is the Antichrist? <laughs> Obama, Elon Musk, or you don't know, or Trump, Judas Iscariot. Jared, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. <laughs> Judas Iscariot, that's pretty much it, right? All right? So do you think literally, there are some questions on that. Do you believe it is literally Judas Iscariot himself, body, soul, spirit? You both believe in that? I believe in that. Okay. I... I think it's highly likely. I have mm -hmm. always allowed the caveat that, at, at a minimum, mm -hmm. that he will have the spirit of Judas Iscariot. Yes, one that thing one that I you'll agree. notice when you study uh -huh. some of those Antichrist passages. Yeah. Um, and, and weirdly enough, John chapter 10, mm. okay, you have the hireling. Yeah. And the hireling goes away when the wolf comes, right? Yes. Whenever you study the Antichrist, there's a lot of duality. To him. Almost like it dealing with Judas Iscariot, you have Judas who was a devil from the beginning, mm -hmm. but when he betrayed Christ, Satan filled his heart. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of interesting duality with, with the Antichrist as far as um, what kind of person he is into what kind of person he becomes and how abruptly that transition is. Oh, very interesting. Oh. I, I think that Judas was conceived of the devil. Mm -hmm. uh, John the 6, Bible right? calls, yeah. the, Bible, the Bible calls him the son of Simon, mm -hmm. but it also calls, if I'm not mistaken, gosh, I'm going to say this to all these people out here. Say <laughs> 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 on, man of God, hang on. <laughs> hang on, let me, let me get my handy dandy Bible. Right oh, views are going up on live stream now. Wow. I'm views sorry. are going up really high, man. I'm, I'm getting ready to leave. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here it is. I, I thought I was right. And I was. Um, Luke 3.23, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Mm. So the Bible, the Bible calls Jesus the son of Joseph. Um, mm. And basically we understand that he wasn't the actual son of Joseph. Well, it was as was supposed. Mm -hmm. So the Bible calls Judas the son of Simon, but Judas is the only human to ever in the history, well, in that same history, in all of Scripture, to be called a devil. He's the only one. Okay? Now, Peter is called Satan because what? Jesus is speaking to Satan, or speaking to Satan through proxy to yeah. Peter. Uh -huh. But the only person ever called a devil is Judas. I think that has to be taken into consideration. Oh, very um, so, I think that Judas was the original offspring of the devil because... But if Judas is, if, if, if things could have been fulfilled in the, in the life of Christ, yeah. and I believe that they could have, yeah. then Judas would have had to be the seed of the serpent. Uh -huh. So, because that's, that's who it is. It's yeah. the woman's seed versus the serpent's yeah, seed. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so Judas dies and goes to his own place. Uh -huh. The Bible talks about the, the, the Antichrist coming out of the pit, Correct. which is where Judas went. Yes. And then, actually, don't tell Randy, but I think I got this from him. <laughs> uh, in John chapter 5, Jesus said, I come to my Father's name, and he have not received me, but one will come in his own name, yeah, yeah. him ye will receive. Yeah. Actually, I think I got this from Russ, but I don't know. Yeah, you didn't get this from me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know how I got Randy and Russ. Wow, you gave us credit, bro. <laughs> Shows up, mm -hmm. 
he's gonna use his faith. He's gonna be. He's gonna say, "Hey, I'm Judas Iscariot." He's coming in his own day. Oh, uh, because if you look at like the gospel, of, you know, the gospel of Judas that was found recently, yeah, or a couple yeah. years ago, however recently it was, been a couple years. You know, in that gospel, Judas is quote unquote the good guy because he's yeah. just doing what had to be done. That's right. um, and that's a, a, a more common, even among the Satanists. You know, Satan is actually the good guy and Judas is actually the good guy. So I think that when the Antichrist shows up, I think he's going to say, hey, I'm Judas, everybody already knows me, I'm Judas Iscariot. You know, uh, this is just my own two cents. So then I think this, because Catholics, they claim they worship Jesus. But you know how they do that Catholic Mass, and then they mention Lucifer's name there. But then their argument is because of a Latin translation. Lucifer matching with Daystar Morningstar. So I think already, I think this is just my opinion. Because for some churchgoers who think, well, you know, who are lost, like Catholics, you know, if they say, well, I can't worship Judas Iscariot. But, you know, if the Antichrist, he comes in his own name, literally, like you said, uh, Judas, and I think I could be wrong, but that was very close with Judah, I think, or yeah. something like that. So I think it, it, it's the Greek form. Judas yeah, Greek form. form so I think exactly. that because of like those uh, modern translations, what they're doing yeah. with their Greek and Hebrew garbage and then translation garbage, I think Judas Iscariot he can get away with just literally naming himself, coming in his own name, and people will see that as Jesus to them, you know, if they play translation-wise. But I think that's just my two cents on that, I think. That's very possible. Well, every, every modern translation that I know of takes the main, takes Lucifer out. I yeah, mean, correct. Name, yeah, they do I that. I want my name out of there, too. Mm. And yeah. they put Daystar there, you know. Uh, so. Mm. Just two quick points yeah. on, on Judas and, and Judah. Uh -huh. Um... You know, imagine if he does come in his own name uh, to the Jews, the scripture that they're going to be used to linking up to link up to that. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Yeah. And yeah. you know, so on and so forth. One last thing, just for yeah. the sake of everybody there, that's somewhat on topic. Um, Judas is also an excellent picture of someone falling away during the tribulation. So huh. while I, I do believe I agree with Andrew on um, Judas potentially being a, a literal devil yeah. and that not just being a figure statement, um, there's also a, a wealth of information just looking at him pictorially as an individual falling away in the tribulation. And let me give one more thing yeah. here that Kevin, that Kevin Mann showed me okay. years ago. Yeah. Uh, if you look at Matthew 1, uh -huh. the names in the Bible uh -huh. that are mentioned there in Matthew 1, the sixth name mentioned, so you have Jesus, uh -huh. you have David, uh -huh. you have Abraham, you have Isaac, you have Jacob, uh -huh. and then the fifth or the sixth name mentioned in verse 3 is Judas. Mm -hmm. So the sixth name wow. in the New Testament is Judas. Wow. Now that's of course referring back to mm -hmm. Judah, yeah, in the Old Testament. Yeah. Well, who's the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Joseph. Joseph. Uh huh. Well, who was the guy that recommended Joseph be sold for thirty? Yeah, Judah. Of silver? Judah. Uh huh. It was Judah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that's just a, a lot of a lot of things that point to this name, yeah. Judas. Yeah. And so that's why I think it's the potential of be, being used in the future. Wow. What about 13? Is there something with his name? And then uh, you mentioned one example with 6. Does Kevin Mann have something on that with Judas Iscariot and 13 connected to the Antichrist? Or do you both have any uh, well, thoughts on that? Ju Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is 13 letters. Yes, correct. Correct. But is there like... That's, that's not what I would love. Mm -hmm. Okay then. All right. Well, that was a lot of interesting stuff, gentlemen. All right. One question I have is, um, if you both were to debate each other, what doctrine would it be? I mean, I don't know what everybody would want. Or your to opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the Trinity. Oh, the Trinity. The, Trinity. <laughs> the Gap. The Gap, yeah. I think so, too, yeah. You, but, I have debated before. 
uh, with, with Brother Reese, which yes, I, yes. I would say if people want um, the opposite position of mine, yeah. one of the best places to find it uh -huh. is Brother Reese. He's actually got a 10-week uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. study that he did on it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. aside from me not believing the gap part, mm -hmm. there's a lot of really good stuff associated with yeah. yeah, he uh, he has a lot of interesting stuff on that one. Uh, I've still yet to sink in in my head actually on that one, on the Genesis yes. Gap. Did you come up with anything yourself, uh, Pastor Sluter, uh, on the Genesis Gap? Any further nuggets or insights that you had? Or did Randy <laughs> come up with them all? Or? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I have to spend a, a terrible amount of time. I have to, yeah. I have to spend as much time as most Bible believers have. Yeah. I definitely believe it. Yeah. Um, but it's not something that I've spent a whole, whole lot of time sure. on. Uh -huh. Do you, did you uh, get into any study yourself, Pastor, about what could have happened at Genesis 1-1 besides fallen angels being around? Have you delved into any studies or anything like that before? I'm just curious. Well, I think the one thing that I've really been mulling around with by this is this is not this is not what I believe. Yeah. This is just something I'm considering. Yeah. And I think me and you have also talked about it before. Uh -huh. So 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 if y'all pastor has talked about this, he got it from me, all right. Just let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Everyone all right. Right. <laughs> but, uh, one thing I am considering I would call myself quote unquote a young earth creationist. I do uh -huh. think that uh -huh. Genesis one Verses two and on yeah. occurred about six thousand years ago, uh -huh. but I do think that there is some interesting stuff as far as the age of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, especially yeah. some of these older civilizations that they're finding. Yes, I um, saw that too. Yeah. And so, and then of course the pyramids and different things and different structures. Mm -hmm. One thing I've been considering is is that the possibility of some of these structures yeah. being built. Prior to to the creation of Adam and Eve mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. by the angelic beings yeah. that were once on the earth, uh -huh. the reason for that is mm -hmm. is that you know the Bible says the earth was without form and void. Yeah. Okay. Now, in my mind, for whatever reason, I just always had imagined you know without form and void, mm -hmm. it, it was without form. It was just like this swirling mass of mud. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, though, is like that Jesus Christ was said to be without form. He had no form or comeliness. Well, he just wasn't a swirling mix uh -huh. of flesh. Uh -huh. you know, he obviously looked like a man. Uh -huh. So that without form doesn't mean that it didn't actually have like a, uh, a shape, shape or yeah, form. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I just, that's something about the gap that I've been considering. You know, is, are, is some of the evidence of older civilizations or older structures seemingly, seemingly, yeah. Could that be evidence of the, of, you know, we often say, well, the giants helped build the pyramids. Well, yeah. maybe it wasn't even the giants. Yeah, it could maybe be it angels was, themselves. Maybe it was something else. Yeah. Uh, you maybe know, it was pre-Genesis 1, 2. It's possible because it's not just on Earth. Some scientists, because I, uh, obviously, when people have been debunking evolution, the one they always go for is the age of the universe and the Earth, you know, that's what they always go for, but I feel like um, there are uh, other arguments that you could use for creationism because when I study both sides there is uh, the, the, you mentioned about the old Earth artifacts and some stuff it was pretty interesting to me so if it's true, I've heard about people where they looked at different uh, planets out there, if people watching online believe in planets, <laughs> but then in space and planets yeah. out there, that because those, if if those angels were traveling all over there, they were building yeah. stuff over there too. So not just on Earth, but somewhere everywhere. Mars, yes, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and, and again, this is uh, this is out there, but yeah, I'm it's just really speculation. Start, like looking at Mars, mm -hmm. and I've got a few books on Mars down in my, uh -huh. well, office isn't here anymore, it's at the new church mm -hmm. But if you, if you start looking at Mars, mm -hmm. this is going to sound like conspiracy theory enough case to get out the temple <laughs> You're not crazy but, enough? <laughs> You're not crazy enough? <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but if you start looking at Mars, it yeah. does seem to be that there's some weird stuff on Mars that yeah. scientists either know about and are trying to cover and ignore, yeah. uh, or just uh, 
completely turned a blind eye to. I don't know. Yeah. There's some weird stuff on Mars. I have to agree that there's weird stuff going on, if not on Mars, but out there. That one I do know for a matter of fact. Um, I think Dr. Upman mentioned about that too. Uh, Brother Keener, do you believe that there's weird stuff out there as well, or did you have any uh, any stuff that you were interested on that? Or well, yeah. you discovered our well, I'll, I'll second what he said. I, yeah. I do think there's weird stuff out there, for yeah. sure. Um, so I, I don't have problems with that at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alrighty then. Well, that was a lot of interesting stuff. Well, as much as I want to continue it, I want to respect your time. I promised one hour with you gentlemen, so we're going to end it right here. But before we leave, I just want to uh, tell everybody that uh, uh, these two are very, very great preachers, actually. Yeah. So they preach really well. I had the privilege of preaching uh, with these two before, and I count it a great honor. Uh, as you can tell, you know, uh, they're not dumb people, so <laughs> they have some interesting studies if you're interested. Um, you both, I think, uh, so Brother Keener, I think you published uh, a book or booklets yourselves. Can you both tell everybody what books or booklets you have? And then some people can start probably purchase them. Well, I have two. I have Divorced but Not Demoted. Yeah. And that's just a small, small booklet on, on divorce. Um, how to how to get a divorce. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's if you've been through a divorce or you know, it's just it's basically a biblical study yes. on divorce. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote another one um, on called Calvinism in the Crosshairs, which I believe Amen. you uh, mentioned yes, uh, it, for one of your teachings. Yes, I did. So uh, those are the two that I've written. Yes, sir. Um, I, I've got one out right now. Uh, it's Christ in the Covenants. Yes. Uh, during COVID, I did a study. Oh, what happened here? Yes, okay. that was put online. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Hold on one second, Rob. What's up here? The big screen shutting down. Why is it shutting down, Rob? Maybe because of no touching. Yes, yeah, that's the end. Just touch it. Just touch it. Yeah. Okay. Keep it on. Yeah. Keep on. Yep. Why is it? <laughs> Keep it on or not in minute? Oh, not in this session. Okay, there we go. All right. Sorry, gentlemen. All right. Sorry, gentlemen. All right. All right. Does that hurt All right. Bro Brother Keener, everyone would have bought Sluter's books and not yours if we just ended right here. So, <laughs> could you tell them again? Oh, that, that would have been a real shame. Um, so, I've got one out right now, Christ in the Covenants. Um, it, it's from a study I did during COVID. It's, it's all published uh, online on my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the transcripts from the teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got one coming out after the first of the year uh, mm -hmm. concerning a Christian's interaction with government. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that will be coming out mm -hmm. probably about mid-January. Mm -hmm. And it's called uh, Children of Obedience. Mm -hmm. Because as believers, we are not seeking to be disobedient. We're not yeah. even seeking mm -hmm. civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. We're just seeking to be obedient to the highest power. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the power that ordained the powers which are is God. So mm -hmm. it, it's just uh, uh, probably about a hundred or so page book on that topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we've got plans. We'll be putting out uh, a, a Bible-believing devotional Oh. That's focused on getting families to come together oh, and having family devotions. Wonderful. Amen. Can you expound Christ and the Covenants uh, to the people? Uh, explain what that book is about, the first one. Uh, yeah, so Christ and the Covenants, it, it's essentially just the covenants and, and how that um, throughout the scriptures, the covenants... Uh, they lend themselves to dispensationalism mm -hmm. and how Christ fulfilled these things. Yes. Uh, it deals with all eight of the covenants, so uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's the basic of, of the study there. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Gentlemen, I want to humbly thank you both so much for doing Amen. this for me. This means a lot to me, but more importantly, my people, you bless them. Thank you for doing this for me and my people. Will you please give them a hand and say thank you? the Lord will lead upon your hearts where we can do this again, but I know that it would bless us a lot. So we'll see how the Lord moves after that. But thank you so much. We enjoyed such a great time. Thank you for starting out our watch night with a lot of fun.
So let's go to Mark, and you'll look at the, my outline, but I wondered about Mark 824 for a very long time. So let's turn there. I always wondered, and I just thought, why is it there? And what does he mean by, by this verse? And, you know, does it have any validity to, uh, to the statement? Is there any validity to the statement that is, is put here? Who are we? We're, we're Bible believers, right? Yes. And we believe in every word? Okay. Yeah. In that case, there's got to be some truth in here that God wanted to show us. And it's, it's our responsibility to look it up because, you know, he told us to search the scriptures. All right, Mark 8.24 says, And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And just for context, if you look at verse 22, it says, This is Jesus. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and, he, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. This was, the treat this was Jesus' treatment for this man, for this blind man. And some, some people might say, oh, maybe it was a tuning error. He didn't really have his powers in check. Uh, oh, okay, well, so he, he rubs spit on his eyes and he, and he opens it up and he's like, I see men, but they look like trees. They're walking as trees. What does it mean? Yeah. Well, okay, well, are men and trees related? Oh, yeah. Let's find out. That's what we're going to talk about. Amen, brother. All right, so I decided to explore what the scriptures say about trees and how they may be related to men. Turns out we're kind of related, not in the, not in the sense that we came from trees, okay, but in the sense that there are some similarities between the structure of trees and the structure of our bodies and the way that trees grow and go throughout their life cycle and the way that Christians do. And it's really uncanny because the Bible has some points about uh, comparisons between men and trees. Yeah. We'll, we'll show that later. So let's see. So we have some similarities. Again, like I said, we believe the Bible is true no matter what, because this, if this isn't true, there's nothing that's true in the world. So let's see. It's a good, it, like I said, it's a very good exercise to think about God's word in a practical way. And the whole point is we're looking into why God said something. And that, that should be point enough, right? Because he told us to study the book. Okay. So your vascular system. This is what I'm, what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna get into anatomy. I, so I was in dental school for the past like five months and I died, I'm here. I barely survived, okay, I crawled out. I had a really hard time. Anatomy was one of the toughest classes I took. I don't think I, don't think I ever stressed out so much about any classes until I took that class, it was ridiculous, wow. it was hard. But you know how, tr you know when you look at a tree, you have a trunk and from there you have roots, right? And the root system is very elaborate you have a really thick root, and from that root, you get a bunch of branches, right? Well, your body structure is exactly the same way. So you have arteries and veins. For those of you who don't know, arteries are blood vessels, things, basically pipelines that carry blood away from your heart. Veins are the pipelines that bring blood from every part of your body back to your heart. So your heart's like the central, we'll call it a central trunk or base or whatever you want to call it but it's in the middle, kind of on the left side, actually, kind of on the left side of you, and it accepts everything. But from there, it's got little branches. It's got one big branch called the aorta that goes up and arches, and then it's got branches coming out of it here and there. And the way it's organized is like a tree. You got, it's got branches and branches and branches, and eventually these branches join together into what's called a capillary bed. Let me show you a picture so you understand what I mean. That's the nervous system. But you see how... This is where your heart's supposed to be in the middle. Yeah. Like right here, this is around where your heart is supposed to be. This is what you call the aorta. This is the ascending portion. There's arch and going down. But anyway, you see how this looks like a tree? Kind of uncanny, right? Hey, I know I might be stretching it a bit, but I'm just saying, let's just, just entertain me for a little while. Yeah. It looks interesting, right? You have a central starting point, and from there you get all these branches. And all these branches supply every part of your body down to your toes. Uh -huh. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. You see how many arteries there are? There's, a, there's the popliteal artery, there's the anterior tibial artery, radial artery, whatever. There's a billion more. Yeah. There are so many smaller arteries that you can't see. But the point is, they all branch out. You look like a tree. Yeah. Interesting, right? Okay, well, that's not the only thing. So when we, when we go in the lab, and we actually dissect human specimens, right? 
it looks exactly the same way. It's so complicated. The, the reason why it's so hard for surgeons to do surgery is because they don't know, or it's hard to make sure that you don't damage certain structures. They're very close to each other. It's hard to see underneath the skin. But that's the wonders of how the Lord made us. That's what I think. So you have all these branches and these networks, just like almost like a network of roots and, you know, the, the stuff that comes out of the roots. And so it's not the only thing. Your nerves also have branches. If I took all the nerves out of you and I just put it on this board, it looks like a tree, okay? I didn't bring an actual specimen because I, I didn't know how people would be with, with an actual anatomical picture. So I didn't, I didn't bring that, but I, I did bring a diagram. So you have a, you have a, obviously you have, a, I hope you have a brain, but <laughs> you have a brain, right? You have a brain here. <laughs> uh, we use it to think. From the brain, you get these branches off your brain called cranial nerves, right? You do, do a bunch of different functions. You don't really need to know about it. You, you need your brain to smell. You need your brain to see. You need your brain to think and to move. Very interesting, right? Okay. So you have these, you have this like really thick cord going down the vertebra and that's like this column of bones here. You have your spinal cord going down. From your spinal cord, you get, these, you get these branches out of your spinal cord. It really looks like a tree. It's not, God wasn't just putting this in the book because he thought it would be funny. There's some truth to that. You really do look like a tree. Look at all these, look at all these nerve endings. And it's crazy. It's, it gets even smaller. This is, this is just a ma like a macro picture, but when you get into like your hands, like your, your fingers have little nerve endings, it's insane. So the way your body is organized is oddly kind of like a tree. Yeah. Really, just entertain me for a little while, but kind of cool, right? It's, yeah. There's some, some crazy similarities there. Okay, your veins, your veins are the same way. You see, you remember the picture with the arteries? Your veins are exactly the same way, except they direct all the blood from wherever, from the ends of your body back to the heart. Cool, you need all that stuff. Okay, so you, and trees kind of do the same thing. You have trees with roots that gather up nutrients from the ground, right? Yeah. We don't really do that, but what your blood does is when it travels through your blood vessels, it carries all these nutrients, it carries hormones and whatever chemicals you have so that your body can function properly. Wow. Without these roots, you will die, okay? <laughs> if you have a blood vessel injury, if, if, especially if it's a big blood vessel, it's only a matter of time until you ble bleed out, right? So these are very important. The roots of a tree are important in that sense because without the roots, yes. your trees will die. Pretty cool, okay. And also consider the fact that we have arms and legs. What do you call, we call them your limbs, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Okay, trees have limbs too, okay? <laughs> if you look at it in the dictionary, a limb could be an extension or, or the main branch of a tree. I think that's what dictionary.com said. Not an archaic dictionary, by the way. This is a modern dictionary, so you can't, don't, don't be too skeptical about that. Okay, your hair. How is your hair structure? Have you guys ever heard, um, I, you might, you might have people, like when you dye your hair, once your hair starts growing out, you have these, the, the color changes at the roots of your hair, right? Your hair has roots. You might be thinking, I'm really stretching it here, but you're, you're seeing a similarity here, right? You have roots in your hair, and you have this branch that goes out. Guys, this is... This is crazy. In one line of scripture, you have a, you have a very gross description of human anatomy, which is really cool. Look, you see this right here? This is the root of a hair right there. And then you have this thing going out like a tree. I don't know. You have, and do you see how convoluted this stuff is? You have glands, you have all these blood vessels. Don't they look like a bunch of branches? Look at this stuff. Crazy, right? All these branches everywhere. Guys, it's, the Lord wanted to tell us something. I truly believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And, if it and if I may give a little bit of heresy here, and not, maybe heresy. not heretical. Yeah. Hey, this is, just what, hey this, is what I just, this is just what I think, okay? It's not explicitly in the Bible, hence why I say it might be heresy. Don't, don't stone me, okay? But what if the Lord allowed this guy to see an x-ray vision? I don't know, a crazy thought, right? Yeah. Yeah. But... It, there's some imaging protocols, like an angiogram, for example, that allows you to image blood vessels within your body, okay? You would look like a tree if you were just seeing it in that view. There are certain imaging techniques that let you do that. So, I don't know. I don't know. Why did the Lord put it in here? I don't know, but this is really cool because it gives us kind of an insight into what the Lord is thinking. 
he might, he might have put it in here for no reason. I don't know, but I don't think so. The Lord never just does something for the sake of doing something. He's got a purpose behind it. Maybe he wanted us to explore it and take a look. I don't know. Could, if, you, if you told Luke during this time and told him, hey, your body is kind of like a tree. He may or may not have believed it. I don't know how advanced medicine was back then, but he may or may not have believed it. But if you just told the common man on the street and say, you're like a tree, he would have looked at you and just kind of went like, what? Are you crazy? He must be a witch. Stone him, you know? I don't know. <laughs> must have been pretty crazy, right? So th there's, some, there's some truth in here. It's really cool. That's why I wanted to talk about it. Your lungs also look like a tree. Let's see why. Okay, I think I have a picture of some lungs here. Okay, so if you look at this here, this, is a, this part up here is about the level of your neck. It's called the cricoid cartilage. It's probably around here. From here, it goes down, and then it branches into these two things, the right and left bronchi, and then it branches again and again and again. If you look, I saw when I was taking this, this anatomy class, in one of our pictures, like dissected pictures, we have a picture of the bronchus, or the trachea, which is this long tube here, and then, and then the bronchi. We have an image of just that dissected away. The lungs aren't even in the picture, but it literally looks like a tree, like a white tree, okay? I, I, I should have brought that picture in, but I don't know. I, just, I didn't bring any of those real pictures because I didn't want to freak anybody out. So, <laughs> I, just, I had to pray about that. I was like, do I, do I bring this in or do I not? <laughs> you know, I didn't want to freak anybody out. So... And I, and I didn't, know, I didn't know how YouTube would take it either. But anyway, you see, it's, you're a tree. If you go, if you divide this further down, in your lungs, they branch out. And then you know what? You branch these out, and eventually what happens, and you get this thing called an alveolus. It looks like a berry, okay? Wow. Like a fruit. <laughs> I don't know, it looks really interesting. Even in textbook diagrams, they look like little fruits. But what they do is... They're very thin, and they exchange oxygen between the environment wow. and your body, which allows you to live. That's incredible. Wow. Your body is amazing, but what's, what I found really amazing is that the Lord pretty much summed up your entire anatomy in one verse. Amen. I don't know. It's, you can't get any more concise than that, okay? That's what I thought. So this, this is pretty cool. Oh, I forgot to show you, show you the venous system, but it's a, essentially the same thing. Lots of branches. Wow. You look like a tree, okay? You, Next time, um, next time you think about anatomy, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm just like a tree. <laughs> if you ever had to take an anatomy class, just think about you being a tree and make it a little easier, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but like I said, my theory is that maybe he had some sort of x-ray vision for just a couple moments. And he, now that allows us to you know, explore the Bible in a very fascinating manner. Yeah. Now, what I found really interesting was in, in the National Geographic, this is not a niche source, okay? This is like, they're like, we are, we are science, you know? <laughs> this, that's the kind of source. Uh, the Smithsonian Magazine had a different article about this also, but it, for those of you who don't know, your nerves work by way of using electricity. So the way it, you conduct electricity through your brain, yeah. and it conducts signals to your nerves and lets you move, right? right. Trees do a similar thing. Oh. They, I didn't know this either. They use diff electricity to send signals to different parts of the tree, so that it can react to environmental hazards or whatever. There's a, I, wrote, I was reading this article, and there's a tree, the, the acacia tree in Africa, um, when it's being eaten by giraffes, I, can you imagine giraffes eating leaves off the trees? Okay, when they start eating these leaves, what happens is the tree starts sending signals to its leaves, and then it starts producing these things called, I think they call it tannins, right? These specific chemicals. And what happens is it's very bitter. Just think of it as the ter leaves turn bitter. Wow. And they're also poisonous. Oh, wow. Wow. And so the tree is defending itself against the giraffes. It also happens to release chemicals into the air. It travels down and tells all the other trees, yo, there's a deer. Wow. Or I mean, there's a, there's a giraffe. It's eating us. You got to be careful. Wow, so then the trees downwind, they start producing the chemicals too. Wow. Wow. Guys, hey, did you, did you, could you have ever imagined that trees are social just like us? Man. I don't know. <laughs> pretty crazy, right? Men, trees, maybe we're not too far off. I don't know. <laughs> but pretty crazy, right? So trees also create and release hormones. Just think of them as chemicals. They're messengers in your body that tell your body to do certain things. What happens? Like, let's say we have Joseph, right? He's growing. 
what happens when there's growth hormone in Joseph's body? He grows. Yeah. Same thing. Trees do the same thing. Interesting. I mean, other animals do the same thing too, but it's uncanny that a man is compared to a tree in the Bible. It's just, I don't know, it's really uncanny. That's what I think. So that's the, that's the anatomical part of it. Pretty crazy, right? You have a lot of similarities in, when you really take a deep down look at it. And you can see the Bible just doesn't have stuff in there for no reason. So when we talk about the life cycle of a tree, you know, as Christians, once we're born again, the Bible says in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, it's about the nine fruits of the Spirit, right? Yes. We bear fruit. Right. Hey, mo not all, but most trees, a lot of trees bear fruit too. Yeah. Well, why is that? Why am, I even, why am I talking about that? Well, because if you think about it, when you're born again, do you immediately produce fruit? No. How long does it take years wow. of nurturing for you to produce fruit? A tree can take anywhere from a year to, I don't know, maybe a couple months to many, many, I don't know, decades or something. I don't know exactly the time frame, but it takes a long time for a tree also to produce fruit. You see the parallel here? It's really interesting. That's why, I think that's why the Lord compared us to trees. Really cool, right? It takes years for us to bear good fruit. It takes years for a tree to bear good fruit. And I'm pretty sure, now don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure depending on what you feed the tree, you get either sweeter fruit or you get less sweet fruit. If it's in bad soil, what happens? So think about it for a second. When you have a plant in bad conditions, like in a dry environment, what happens? It grows up a little bit and the growth is stunted. What happens when you're in a church with a pastor that doesn't preach the entire counsel of God? Your growth gets stunted. You stay at a certain level and you'll never go past that until you move yourself to a better environment. Except trees can't do that, you can, okay? So take advantage of that. So there's that. So really interesting, right? Um, there's in Psalm 1-3. Uh, let's, let's just turn there real quick. Psalm 1-3. Oh, sorry. I just thought it was really cool. This is one of the first, uh, I think this is one of the first verses I memorized, actually. Psalm 1-3, or Psalm chapter 1 in general. We had a memorization exercise. Really cool. Psalm chapter 1, verse... Three, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? Because he's right next to a riverbed. If you're in a Bible-believing church, you're that tree next to a riverbed. You're going to bear good fruit. But the only thing that's different about between you and a tree is that you have the choice to bear fruit. A tree will bear fruit. You have a choice to bear fruit or not to bear fruit. Absolutely. That's the difference. You have free will. Trees don't. So if you're in a Bible-believing church, it's your duty to bear fruit. Yeah. Because that's what we're called to do. That's we're right. supposed to be, um, we're supposed to cause joy for the Lord, not pain and grief, right? Amen. So cool part there. So think about that next time you look at a tree. Oh, I, I want to be like that tree. I want to bear good, sweet fruit for the Lord, right? Yes. Now trees yield seeds Trees don't directly yield seeds, okay, if you want to get nitpicky, but they have fruit and they bear seeds. In, in the Bible, let's go to Genesis 12. This is uh, Genesis 12 and Genesis 13, but we'll look at Genesis 12 and verse 7. This is one of, one of a very uh, large number of scriptures that use the word seed mm -hmm. to refer to offspring yeah. or the descendants of somebody else. Genesis 12, 7 says... And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there, built, there, he, uh, there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Okay, in 13, which is like right next door, Genesis chapter 13, verse 15. Um, you just turn a couple pages or maybe one page. The Bible says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Why do you use the word seed? Why? I don't know, there's some, there must be a reason, but I think it's very interesting. Tree, seed, man. There's, there are some parallels here, right? right? Some comparisons. So I thought what was really interesting, going back to Psalm 1-3, remember I told you about the, being next to a riverbed, being in a good environment. Um, so there is a tree called a bonsai tree. If you don't know what it is, it's like an Asian type of tree, and a common practice is to tie wires around it 
to stabilize it and to maintain its shape. Because people think it's really aesthetic to have this tiny tree bent in a specific way. I don't really get what the hype is about that, but, <laughs> but to make a parallel with that illustration, what happens when we're first saved? We look at the Bible and we're like, look, the first five books are about the laws. They're all about laws that people are supposed to follow. How am I supposed to follow all this stuff? And it's like you're being tied by this wire into a specific shape. And you're like, this is, this is restraining. I don't like it. It doesn't bring me joy. I can't do the things I used to like anymore. But what happens in the end is that those wires that are tied, those wires that are tied around you are really for your protection. Because when you step out of the boundaries and the principles of the Bible, what happens? You get, you get in the same state as a lost man. And then we can't tell you apart. And what happens is you end up doing things that you would have normally yeah. never done. Right. The real you, who's separated from sin, once you get saved, that is, doesn't want to do those things. Uh -huh. The real you, your soul is crying out. The Lord Jesus Christ inside is crying out. But here you are. You're outside of the bounds and the principles of the Bible, and you're messing up your life. So in the beginning, it seems grievous, just like that bonsai tree. Uh -huh. But in the end, you turn out to be this pretty little tree that can yield fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. Really cool, right? That's what I was thinking. And, oh, there was another, so there's another thing, um, another in interesting practice. People will actually make body modifications by placing restraints on themselves. Like some people, I think it's in Africa, there's a culture that wears rings to elongate their necks. And in Chinese culture, they used to do this thing where they bind their feet to have tiny feet. Really interesting. Tree, it's, it's really interesting that trees and plants behave the same way. Like they will grow in with the restraints that you give them. I don't know. I thought that was kind of interesting. But that is really, really interesting. Um, I mentioned about trees being social, right? Who, who would have thought? Really crazy stuff. Older trees have the ability to nurture younger saplings. Did you know that? There are, uh, there are microorganisms, very tiny living things in the soil and they create this web in a network. It's called a fungi network for short. If you want the scientific term, they're called mycorrhizal networks. But <laughs> what happens is, don't worry about that, but they're tiny little webs. Think about it as a web, and trees can use this web to communicate with each other. So an older tree that can get all the sunlight because it's got all these leaves and large branches as they want, it can produce sugar, and it'll ferry it down to the young tree that has barely any leaves, and really no way to get sunlight if it's shaded underneath a bigger tree. And so the sapling survives. How much care do we put in raising our young? We take years to nurture up our young, right? Whether it's literally like Noah or whether, whether it's a baby Christian, it takes years and very careful, I guess, feeding. We feed them the word of God, careful feeding to make sure they nurture up into a good Christian. And it can't be done unless somebody else who's stronger is willing to do the work. That's good preaching. Really cool, right? Really so if you're in a position where you can mentor a younger Christian, it, I think it's in your best interest to do yeah, so. Amen. One, we get better Christians overall as a result. And two, I think it's part of your duty. Yeah, yeah that's good. And you see, these trees form this network and warn each other of environmental hazards, like a fire or something. I, that, I thought that was crazy, okay? But this is apparently something that's possible, and it's, they're researching it, and they have a bunch of papers on it. I looked some papers up. I thought it was really cool. Um, but it's almost like an illustration of the body of Christ. What happens? So when we have a church that's outside, it's not our church, but we're, we have churches that we talk to, right? Yeah. They have a prayer request. What do you do? We ferry prayer requests to each other, and we pray. Yeah. We pray for them just like these trees, <laughs> just like how these trees share nutrients, we pray for each other. Really cool, right? So we have this network called the body of Christ. It's our responsibility to be a good member of the body of Christ. If the trees can do it, why can't we? If a bunch of, if a bunch of plants with no free will can do this, we gotta be able to do something, come on. They said, it's, it's really cool. And, and it brings me to mind that verse where, where the Bible says, you know, the rocks will cry out for God if there aren't any preachers. I, they really might, you know, I'm, I'm sure they will. Yeah, so really just next time you think you're kind of down and you're like, ah, oh, you know, do I really need to go to church? I can read my Bible. I don't know. You want to be better than a tree. I mean, these papers made up for trees, but anyway, <laughs> you want to be better than a tree, right? So let's get some work done. Really cool stuff. And another similarity that I thought was interesting was 
Okay, well, I don't, I don't want to go into the... I, I, I had a part about plants releasing chemicals and their damage to nearby plants. We talked about that earlier. Um, trees can show their condition based on what is to come. For example, in the fall, what happens to trees? They somehow know it's fall. Their leaves fall off. Yeah. They change colors. Yeah. And it kind of shows what's going on in the tree's life. As a Christian, your behavior does the same thing. Oh my goodness, wow. If you're not praying, if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not coming to church, it shows. And it manifests within your behaviors in ways that you don't understand, that you can't see, but others can see. So then you have this, you have this image that is portrayed to others, and you're, which is what we call a testimony, right? So your testimony is kind of like a tree showing forth its current condition. It's very important to think about that because the way you conduct yourself, again, we know how important that is. We have, oh goodness, we have people that call themselves Christians, but they will instead further, I guess, further hinder the cause of Christ because what do they, what does a lot of Christians do when we go street preach? They tell us we're being hateful, but we, yeah. we haven't said a single hateful thing ever. When we say it, I, I can guarantee that because I've, I've been out with, with this church. So if you want to be useful for God, think of a tree next time. You know, when it comes time to pray, you want your leaves to fall off. You want to relax and you want to, you want to get in the zone and you want to pray. Aim to be like that tree. You want to display the signs of a real Christian by your walk. Very important. So I thought that's something that we can glean from what a tree, from this one verse how a tree is related to man. Right. Really cool. Again, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Do you want to produce sour fruit? Do you want to produce no fruit at all? I don't know. That's, that's up to you, but I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. So other miscellaneous similarities I found was the Lord uses uh, trees to symbolize people in judges. Let's go, let's go there. I thought it was really crazy. I, I didn't think there were so many mentions of man and trees in the same sentence in the Bible. But when I looked it up, I was like, there are actually a considerable number of them. Judges 9. We'll look at Judges 9, 8 to 15. Judges 9, 8 through 15. And for time's sake, I'll, I'll read, start reading. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And this is Jotham talking, by the way, one of Gideon's sons, and he's giving a speech here. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by, by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go, go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, it is really interesting how trees are kind of personified here. And it looks like there are a bunch of people talking together. They got little personalities, like the olive tree has its own personality. The vine has its own personality. You have the bramble with its own personality. Cool. It's like it's a personification of a tree. Well, this is not the only one, but another interesting fact is, this might be obvious, but trees need water, right? You also need water to live. You, there's not, we need two types of water. We need water to drink and survive in this world, but we need the water of life from the Amen. Lord Jesus Christ also. So that's pretty cool. And that's in John 4, 10. We don't have to turn there. We have family trees, okay? Uh, <laughs> some uncanny similarities. I know, I know it's kind of silly, right? But we have some uncanny similarities. Why do we call it a family tree? Yeah. An ancestry tree, I don't know. But the Lord must have known we're going to make these little trees coming up, you know, in the future. In Mark 8, 24, I don't know. I'm getting all this out of one verse. Yeah. Trees are about 50% water, men, and women are about 55 to 60%. Wow. Pretty similar. And I have the source here. This is from a government website, so it's not fake. Wow. <laughs> let's see. In Psalm 92, let's go to Psalm 92, 12. I just thought it was so interesting. We have all these mentions. Somehow, I didn't realize it when I was going through the Bible, but we have so many mentions of trees and men at the same time. Why is that? I don't know. But the Lord had some point behind it. 
Psalm 92, 12. And the Bible says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. All I know is that these cedar trees are extremely tall. And they were pristine wood. Like they used it for the best of buildings. Really cool, right? All right, the next one I want to go to is Proverbs 3, 18. Proverbs 3, 18. Again, man, tree, tree, man. I don't go home and think about and dream about trees, but I just, just take it as, a, as an interesting thing to think about. Proverbs 3, 18. The Bible says, She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. If I remember correctly, I think this is talking about wisdom. Um, but... Cool, right? Personified, tree personified. Isaiah 56, Isaiah 56. We're getting ready to wrap up, but Isaiah 56. It's one thing to have me read it, but then also to see it in your Bible, as I want to turn to it. Uh, Isaiah 56, and we'll look at verse 3. Isaiah 56, verse 3. And the Bible says, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. And uh, behold, I am a dry tree. A dry tree is not very happy, okay? It's, it's in pain, it's in distress. All right, 61, Isaiah 61. And let's look at verse 3. Isaiah 61, let's hope I have the right verse. 61, verse 3. Let's see here. Okay, this is part of a prophecy, I believe. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give, give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Wow. Wow. I don't know. There's a lot with trees here. This isn't the only one. Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah. We're almost done. Jeremiah. I hope you find this interesting. I don't know. I thought it was kind of interesting when I was looking it up. I was like, whoa. There's a lot more when you dig into it. Jeremiah 18, or sorry, 17, 8. 17, we'll read verse 8. Jeremiah 17, 8. For some reason, it's, it's like the righteous men are compared to a well-nourished tree. And I thought that was kind of cool. And Jeremiah 17, 8 says, For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when, when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green. And shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. A righteous man is compared to a well-nourished, well-nurtured tree. Really cool, right? Yes. And the last thing I found was people can be cursed, like Noah, or not, like Noah cursed Canaan in Genesis 9.25, as well as trees when Jesus cursed the fig tree. Interesting similarity. Now the point is, and, and I'll conclude and end, end with this here. The point, is, point of this is to show that every statement in the Bible can be validated if you look into it. Right. Yeah. Some we might not be able to yet, but that's what the preachers thought of Revelation when, you know, in Revelation, I think, it was at 11 yes. uh, when it was talking about TV. Yes. No preacher really understood what it was about the 1800s. I, I bet you they didn't know because the technology didn't exist. But what happens? That statement was validated as a prophecy in the future. Yeah. So this, this practical exercise was to show that God's word is true. And if you look into it, you'll find out exactly why. It just takes the digging. The riches are here. It's up for you to search for them. Amen. All right, that's all I have.